What's up everyone, my name is Cody Engel, I am a staff software engineer, and I have been working on software since 2011, I have been working on development teams since 2013, and I have worked at eight different companies over the course of my career. My current developer workflow is really quite productive. It allows me to stay focused on the task at hand without having too much downtime in between my different tasks. And in this video, I am going to teach you my software developer workflow so you can use it yourself, you can be productive as well. So if you stay until the end, you will know all of my tips and tricks for staying productive as a software engineer. So the first thing I do that really kicks off my software developer workflow is I will pick up a story in Jira. When I do this, I will always assign the story to myself. That way other people know that it's assigned to me. I will then move it into the in-progress swim lane. This way folks know that the story is now being worked on. If the story itself is a larger story, I will break this up into subtasks, but generally if the story is small enough, and in, in terms of small enough, usually if it's a five pointer or below, that's usually small enough where I won't break that up into subtasks, but if it's a larger story, I will break that up into subtasks just to make sure that I'm able to continue moving forward on the task at hand. The next thing I do is I will create a new branch. When I create a new branch, I make use of Git Kraken, which is a Git client that just makes using Git much more enjoyable. I'll leave a link to Git Kraken in the description below if you wanna try it out yourself. This video is not sponsored. It is a referral link but it's not sponsored by Git Kraken. So with creating the new branch, the first thing that I have to do within Git Kraken is pull down the changes. So it depends on if we're using trunk-based development or if we're using Git flow. For trunk-based development, I will just pull directly from main, make sure that I'm updated on main. If I'm using Git flow, then I will pull from develop. And again, make sure that develop is up to date. I am now able to create the new branch. So creating it off of main or develop, I will prefix the work with what it is. So if it's a new feature, I will start off with feature. If this is just some general code cleanup, I will prefix it with chore. If this is a bug, I will prefix it with bug. This way it just helps me better organize what I'm working on and it kind of tells me a little bit about the work before even looking at the name of the story. The next part with the branch name is I will use the Jira ID for the very first part. So if it's feature, it'll be feature forward slash and then whatever the Jira issue ID is. After that, I will give a summary of the work in three to four words. It just makes it a little bit easier to understand what's being worked on if you don't wanna look directly at the Jira ticket, but if you need any more information, the Jira ticket is in the branch name. So kind of is the best of, of all worlds. So the next step now that we have the branch created is actually starting the feature development. And so what I like to do is I like to start at the lowest architectural layer and then work my way up. And so what this means is in general, I'll be starting off with changes at the repository layer, and I'll be working my way up to the view layer with those changes. The reasoning behind this is I'm trying to build some building blocks that higher architectural layers can build off of. So I like to think of code as pretty much being like Lego. If it works really well, you can kind of snap the pieces together and it just works. I will typically try to do one commit per component change. This way it helps keep things pretty organized. It also gives me a sense of accomplishment with each new commit that I'm making. It also makes uh, creating meaningful commit messages much easier. I'm not trying to cram a bunch of information in a single commit message. But I do keep the commit messages fairly detailed. I like to use a bulleted list. This part will actually come in handy a little bit later in this video, so just keep that in mind. That is how I break up the work but when it actually comes to implementing the different things, so at the repository layer, at the domain layer, at the view layer, what does that actually look like? So what I like to do is, unless this change is strictly a view change only, I like to practice test room development. And so I will go one test at a time, I will write the test up front with what I wanna do, and then I will type in the code to make that test pass. And then each new test is just checking off another box and it helps keep things really organized. It works out really well. When I'm doing test room development, I also like to do error scenarios first. The reason being is the error scenarios are usually easier to cover than actually implementing the code because usually the error scenarios are just something isn't going well. And so when you're first starting off with a new component, nothing is going well because none of the code is there. So that's why I like to just start off with the errors first, but really it's not a big deal though if you wanna start with the error scenario or the success scenario first. So once all of the code has been written, I like to manually test the changes. This is just one final pass through to make sure that everything is working correctly. Even though I've been doing test room development, it doesn't guarantee that all the components are working 
together correctly. And so by just doing this once over manual test, it allows me to make sure that all the changes are working correctly. If they don't work correctly and I find a bug, I will go write a test case for that bug and then I will go make that test case pass and kind of go back through that, that whole TDD cycle. And I will repeat this step until everything is working correctly. Sometimes everything works correctly the first time I manual test it. Sometimes it'll take three or four different passes to locate some of the edge cases that I couldn't think of while I was developing the feature. So after manually testing the changes, the next thing that I like to do is smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. This is pretty important because it lets me know that this video is helpful to you. So just go ahead, smash the like button if it's helpful, uh, smash the dislike button, I guess, if it's not helpful. And so that is the next step. But after that is actually opening up a pull request. At this point, I will push my branch up with all of the commits. I will navigate over to GitHub to open up the pull request. And then with the pull request, the first thing I like to do is provide a short description. It should be pretty easy for anyone to understand that description. It doesn't get too technical. That way a reviewer understands what's going on. A product manager can read it. They can understand what's going on the engineering manager, they can read it, they can know what's going on. And then after that description, I like to provide technical details about the pull request itself. So remember back when I said that I like to do bulleted lists per commit, this is where it comes in handy because at this point I can look at all of my commits and I can just copy all of the bullet lists into my technical description. That way it tells the developer what the changes were, what went into it, and it makes it a little bit more clear of what's going on. This is also why it's really important to use really good commit messages because there are times where I open up a pull request, I don't remember my reasoning for everything, but I have those commit messages there so I don't really have to think about it. I just go on auto drive, copy and paste some stuff and we're good to go. Then once pull request is open, I will do a real quick check on the code changes itself. I will leave comments on specific blocks of code that I think might have questions with them. Oftentimes I don't leave any comments at all, but sometimes with bigger changes, I will end up leaving some comments to help the reviewer out. At this point, I then assign the pull request to myself. That way I just know that this is the pull request that I have open. It makes it a lot easier to track things in GitHub. I don't have to hunt things down. I then assign the pull request to reviewers. That way they get notifications that this code change is ready for them to review. I'll also post a Slack message with a link to the pull request in my team channel so folks know that the pull request is ready to be reviewed. That way if they don't have notifications on, they are at least getting a notification from Slack so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. So now the pull request is open, the next thing that I will do is respond to feedback as soon as it comes in. If there are any questions on the pull request itself, I'll, I'll answer those questions in comments. If there are any changes that I see that make sense to make, I will make those changes. If the changes don't make sense, then I will reach out to the reviewer on Slack just to figure out what they were thinking of and see if we can find a solution to that question that they had. And that's it. That is the video. So thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already smashed the like button for the YouTube algorithm, please be sure to do that. Also, if you aren't subscribed yet, please be sure to subscribe, click the notification bell. I upload new videos like this one each and every week. And so if you wanna be notified when those new videos are uploaded, that is the best way to do that. We also have a growing Discord community where we're just kind of chatting about coding, chatting about life in general. So if you wanna be a part of that, the link is in the description down below. Be sure to join, it is free to do so. You don't have to pay for any sort of membership to get in. And thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.